<laughs> and I hope that it does an automatic record, which it is, which is brilliant. And this is a nice part when we watch the number of participants ticking up in the corner. Welcome, everybody. Um, it's always lovely to have people along on what in Cornwall is a very sunny, lovely, if chilly, Tuesday, soon to be afternoon. Um, hopefully the weather's been oh, it's been lovely this week. Did anybody see any northern lights? Um, I know it was in Cornwall, but I'm on the wrong coast, so I didn't get to see Desperately it. hoping to see some last night, but no, didn't didn't unfortunately. It was a bit cloudy where where we were. Yeah, um, there was whereabouts in Cornwall are you? Uh, on the south coast in Foy. Oh, so yeah. about halfway oh, wow. down on the south coast. Yeah, it's very beautiful. We're very lucky. Lovely place to live. A long way from London, though. So it's, <laughs> when I need to go in, it's a big commute. But um, I keep I say that's worth it, I think. Um, so we've still got people ticking in. We'll give it just one more minute and then we'll make an official start. Um, nice to see some familiar names there. Thanks for the hi, Emma. <laughs> And then I'll just remove that. Uh, great. It's all about getting everything in the right place with these things, isn't it? Um, good. Right. So I think we're at 12.01. So I think we'll make a nice prompt start. Hi, Susie. Thanks for that. Um, lovely. Welcome, everyone. This is um, an Amberjack webinar, so I'm not going to talk for very long, obviously. I just wanted to say hi um, welcome. We're very lucky to have three Amberjack colleagues with us today. Um, we're, they're going to share some really interesting insights in their latest snapshot of research. So lots of interesting takeaways from this, I am sure. And um, this is being recorded, just so that you know. And um, if you do have questions as we go through, it's super helpful if you can pop them in the Q&A box rather than the chat box, although I'll try and keep an eye on both. And then I'll share questions back to the team um, when we get to the end of the formal presentation session. Um, but without any further ado, um, Emily, I'm going to hand over to you. Perfect. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen. Lovely. And make sure that everybody can see that before we get going. With me. Yeah, looks great. Yeah, can you see? I'm just going to try and start it from there. Um, so I show you one. How do I? So I'm just struggling to get the. Uh, full screen bear with me oh it's a little technical hitch mm -hmm. hang on let me try again all the fun of the fair isn't it <laughs> let me try it again It's not one of those things that you can dive in and help somebody is it? so it's, it's on your screen. Yeah, I can share it with people. There we go. Oh, there Perfect. Perfect. Right. Emily, Thank over to you. you. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to our session today. Um, really pleased that you could join us. Um, so what I wanted just to, to kick off with is what we'll sort of cover today. Um, my name is, um, as I said, Emily. I'm Head of Marketing at Amberjack, and I'm joined today by two of my colleagues. So Sue, um, who is our Head of Attraction, and Martin, who is um, our Head of Assessment. And they will be um, uh, contributing later in the session, just in terms from, uh, of their sort of their, their key areas, sharing some of their insight, but also some of their um, their suggestions for, for looking at the new season and, and some planning elements as well. So just in terms of what we'll cover today, um, we're going to look into some insight into sort of the, the emerging themes for new season. Um, so this is from sort of looking at beginning of season back in, in September through to mid January. And we did this session last year. And it was really helpful just to get a sense of some of those themes that might be emerging and hopefully then build those into some of the planning that you'll want to do for the new season. Um, for those of you who, who, who know Amberjack, we do a, a bigger piece of research in June, which is called our Insights Research. So this is almost a little snapshot um, into that. Um, 
and uh, yeah, and you'll get the full the full set of data slightly later in the year. But we'll look at those emerging themes. We'll we'll be doing some year on year comparisons, just looking at those applications, uh, so the the levels of those, but also the the diversity element and angle of those applications. Um, we have managed to pull some um, data for, for key sectors as well. So some nice sector comparisons. And then I said, you know, Martin and Sue will come on to, to talk you through their particular areas and some ideas for, for new season planning. So hopefully today, at least a couple of things for you to take back to your organisations to think about, but hopefully some, some benchmarking data as well. So you're able to see how you might be performing against those um, other organisations in your sector. Um, so just to give you a sense of the data set that we're reviewing today, um, we've looked at data from 22 employers um, across 12 sectors and analysed data from around 118,000 candidate applications. Um, and looking at that data, as I say, from start of season through to, to mid-January. We supplemented this with um, insight from our own teams as well. So our uh, client partners and our account directors who are, are clearly at the forefront of delivering all of these campaigns um, speak regularly with all of our clients that have that broader um, insight and, and knowledge across the sector as well. So combination of, of, of both of those has enabled us to, to really pull together some, some sort of high level themes to, to talk you through today. It's also worth noting that the, the graduate data is, is, is slightly more complete than the apprentice data, so we have managed to pull some, some comparisons for both sectors, um, but the graduates obviously um, usually go to market earlier, so more of the hiring is complete, um, but we'll, we'll talk you through that data as we, as we go through. Um, so we're going to start with key recruitment challenges and actually the, the slide that I'm showing you here is our slide for my 2022 insights um, report. Um, and you'll see on the right hand side the rank order challenges in terms of last recruitment season, um, what were the main challenges for employers. Um, and it was quite a change uh, from, from the previous year where we were very much still in the, in the midst of the pandemic. Last year, we sort of reverted back to those traditional challenges, if you like, around diversity and inclusion, attraction, um, and Renee's was actually very high up on the list as well. It's something that we'll touch on a little bit later. In terms of the challenges this season, um, there isn't any huge change, although I would say that probably attraction may be um, slightly more of a challenge just at the moment, and that might be the time of year. Um, and Renegs is obviously too early to, to report on, but we've definitely seen um, a challenge around withdrawals in the process. Um, and also non-completion of assessments. So there's definitely some, um, you know, definitely some you know, indications that challenges are, are similar, but maybe a slight change um, year on year. And those challenges really underpin, I guess, the, the key themes that we're seeing emerge from, from this new season. Um, and, and the first one that we um, that we look at is that that whole piece around returning to in-person activity. Um, so, you know, on campus um, activity has, has definitely returned, um, you know, this year. And Sue's going to touch on some of this in, in her section. Um, but certainly it seems more popular with students um, than, than, than the virtual piece. And we've, we've conversations that we've had with, um, uh, you know, with our clients and, you know, those that are continuing with virtual events have definitely reported that, you know, the virtual, um, the virtual world in terms of events has, you know, is, is, is attracting lower registrations, but not only that, there seems to be a much higher dropout as well. So that return to face-to-face -to -face activity on campus is, it seems to be a real preference for students. Um, and obviously that engagement is, um, you know, with employers is, is really improving as a, as a consequence. What we haven't seen though, is necessarily the same return to face-to-face -to -face, um, um, uh, I guess, face-to-face -face engagement from a recruitment process perspective. So 60% of employers that we served as are still operating a fully virtual recruitment process. Um, and that's for a number of reasons. And, and Martin will touch on, on some of this, but um, Martin and his team have, have done some, some, some really interesting research, um, certainly looking at the assessment centre piece and found that 70% of candidates are still preferring the virtual assessment centre process um, rather than the in-person going to an organisation's office to, 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 um, you know, to complete that stage of the process. And Martin, I don't know if you want to just um, sort of highlight or, or touch on that a little bit more. Yeah, thanks, Emily. So, so it links into the point that we're talking about with Renegs as well. So um, 
for those who aren't aware, so a renege is where someone accepts an offer and then before they join the organization decides to, to change that. Um, it's really interesting. So we, we've got a, a very standardized feedback survey in our assessment center processes. So we can benchmark assessment centers against each. Ooh, you can really prefer a virtual assessment center where you can join online or an in-person assessment center where you get to attend the recruiting organization's office. Um, and as Emily said, 70% of candidates who've completed that question have said they actually prefer virtual assessment centers over in-person events. And I think this is part of the changing behavior of, of, of candidates, particularly as you'll see uh, higher Rene rates in graduate roles and apprentice roles, where graduates are applying for a large number of different for where they need to attend their actual uh, graduate program. So they're, they're much more a situation where candidates are applying to lots of different processes at once, and therefore it being virtual is attractive to them, so it gives them more flexibility to complete. So this is one of the biggest shifts uh, we're seeing, uh, and I was really interested in that stat. I didn't think it would be as high as 70% preferring virtual assessment centres, but a really important consideration uh, for future seasons so thank you Emily. Thank you Martin and I think you know that that sort of I guess really sums up that that first emerging theme that we're seeing is around you know there's a definite preference it seems in those earlier stages for candidates to be able to engage directly with employers see them face to face and have that interaction and then in the actual recruitment process that flexibility around the you know around the virtual pieces is still there so really one to watch and one to think about going into into new season. Um, the second theme that we have seen um, emerging is a, a sort of a normalisation, if you like, of applications um, post pandemic. So you'll all remember the huge increase in applications that employers saw right at the beginning of the pandemic. And as we worked through that, that first season. And, you know that you know employers were in a in a very um, you know difficult position. You know many weren't able to to continue with the same level of um, vacancies that they'd have previously. Um, and then we came to to last year where we moved into this um, you know very interesting time where you know very candidate led market, many more vacancies, and all of a sudden within a space of twelve months it completely seemed to shift and uh, employers were you know. Uh, feeding back that year on year there was a huge drop in applications so and albeit you know back to sort of post-pandemic levels but a real shift year on year and what we've seen this year is a sort of a flattening out if you like of those of those applications so year to date and you know this isn't the whole season we've seen a, a small decrease in the number of uh, graduate applications and a modest rise in the number of um, apprentice applications and you know, we're, we're putting the apprentice applications down to the fact that that market is growing rapidly. So those of you that were in attendance at the ISC apprenticeship conference will will know that, you know, they reported sort of an 18, 19 percent increase in, in, in the size of that market, whereas the graduate market probably a two to three um, percent increase. So there's a much bigger, um, you know, uh, change in terms of the number of vacancies and opportunity in the apprentice space. And that's you know what we fear is playing out here in terms of the applications. Um, and albeit that some, um, you know, overall we've seen a small decrease in graduate applications, there are still some sectors that are, you know, increasing year on year. And the two standouts are the professional services and, and financial services that are clearly very popular destinations for, for graduates. In terms of withdrawals, um, what we've seen year on year is that there isn't a huge difference in the number of withdrawals for, from a graduate perspective. So we've seen a slight increase in graduates withdrawing from a process, so that 1.5% 1, 1 increase year on year. Um, but there has been an enormous jump in the number of apprentices withdrawing, and, and Martin will touch on that a little bit right in, in terms of some of the reasons we might be, be seeing that. But, but overall, we're seeing a sort of a levelling out of applications and hopefully, you know, a normalisation um, after after the pandemic. So I guess and then moving on to the next stage is that is that hiring piece. And, and what we're seeing year on year is actually that speed to hire seems to have dramatically increased. And we think this is probably as a consequence of the really competitive market that we've you know, that we've seen over the last 18 months. Um, and employers seem to have focused on the speed of their process. 
and making those offers earlier just due to the to the market conditions so you know it, your graduates seem to be you know taking multiple offers sitting on those offers you know there's a real sort of um challenge here in terms of managing you know the the, the, the Renegade piece as well. Um, but it certainly seems that employers are very focused and, and are reacting to this market in terms of trying to get their offers out much, much earlier. We've also seen uh, an increase in MPS scores. So for, for those of you who, who aren't familiar with MPS scores, it's a, it's a standard measure for, for looking at how a, a candidate uh, reviews a, a process and, and marks it, if you like, in terms of their experience. So we've seen an in increase in MPS scores across the board, certainly from our clients, um, and that really sort of indicates a focus on candidate experience as well. So this whole piece of making sure that the process is really um, designed and, and focused on creating great experience experience that candidates are engaged they're going to stay in the process um, seems to be playing out um, there's as I said a significant increase in the offers made year to date for both graduates and apprentices or graduates is, is, is more uh, significant um, and you know that continued virtual recruitment process means that those you know those those faster hiring times are, are being enabled so Speed to hire seems to be, be a focus. And I think one of the consequences of that will be that keep warm piece. So, you know, lots of offers being made early. What is the consequence of that going to be as we move through uh, until, until September? And then the final piece is around this continued um, uh, sort of increase in, in or sort of certain improvement in, in female and, and BAME hiring. So what we're what we sort of employers are reporting back to us is that both female and BAME hiring is 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 positive, and um, that year on year they're seeing an increased number of female applications. But that's also then um, moving through to to hire as well. So, and, and gender and ethnicity seem to be the core areas. Um, that employers are focusing on currently um, and it may it may be just this this year but we we seem to have certainly from from our experience less employers focused on the social mobility piece although not necessarily not focusing on it at all but it seems to be further down the list in terms of priority so it'd be interesting to see how that plays out um, and if that does have an impact on 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 the hiring um, data as we move through uh, through the season so in terms of the, the four key, sort of key themes we're seeing currently, um, that's a, a quick overview of, of those. Um, and just to share, I guess, some of the data that sits, uh, sits behind those themes. And what, we, what we've got here is a sort of a comparison of, of graduates and apprentices. So you can see at the top here, the, the, the graduate data and then below the apprentice data. And what we've tried to do here is give you, I guess, a bit of a, um, a comparison year on year. So what we saw last year compared to compared to this year. So I touched on earlier that we've seen um, around a 3% drop in, in graduate applications. Um, if we looked at last year, we were uh, across the board, employers were reporting or the data was showing us that they were having a 35% decrease in, in applications. So that normalization of applications and, and um, uh, post pandemic is, is, as we said, is sort of playing out. But what we have seen is, you know, 67% increase in graduate offers made, which is, is pretty significant. Um, and obviously dramatically different from from last year so we we certainly think that this is a, a reaction to the market and um you know as a consequence you know, employers wanting to get those offers out and making sure that they are first um to to do that with with their candidates and because of those sort of the, i guess the increase in offers we've also seen a spike um across the board in, in female offers and BAME offers now we expect this to sort of level out um over probably over the the next few months um but you know interestingly there's still been a 14 percent increase in female applications even though there's been an overall overall drop in applications and a 29 percent increase in BAME applications year to date so this hopefully indicates that the work that employers are putting in place to engage with those groups um, is, is working and that they are applying, you know, early, potentially a little bit earlier in the process as well. And hopefully that will play out in terms of the, the hires as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the apprentice data isn't as complete because not as many offers have been made at this point, but we have seen um, a 17% increase in applications um, Year, year to date and uh, compared to, to compared to last year and that increase in in offers as well um 
female hiring at the moment isn't such a positive picture so there's been a, a drop off in those female applications um, uh, but there has been an increase in, in BAME applications so again probably too early to tell exactly how that will look at end of season um, but certainly from a applications and, and an office perspective that has that has increased um, year on year. Um, and I, I mentioned earlier that we've we've managed to pull together some some sector analysis as well. And hopefully for those of you on the call or from these sectors, it will just give you a, a bit of a benchmark at this point in time, um, a bit of a snapshot into how others are um, experiencing those applications and, and offers as well. So um, professional services I mentioned earlier. And they've they've reported a, a small increase in applications and, and their offers are, are up year to date. There's been a small drop off um, in female applications and, and offers, but again, it's 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 marginal and that will probably play out over time. Um, 30 percent of their offers are made to females currently and 37 percent are, are BAME offers and three percent of their applications have, have of applicants have been hired. So that's um, that's a that's a, a good indication that the quality is is there as well. Engineering is slightly different. Um, there's been a, a small decrease in applications and a and a 21 percent decrease in in offers year to date. Um, although the female um, data is, is is looking positive and obviously within that sector is 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 very important. Um, gender is is definitely a key a key focus. Um, currently, 40% of offers have been made to, to females and 40% of offers have been made to, to BAME candidates and 1% and of applicants have been hired, so slightly lower than, than the professional services sector. And then for, for public services, um, we have seen an, a, a good increase in applications, a small increase in, in, in offers. 60% um, of applications for them are currently for females, but slightly lower for, for, for the BAME um, candidates. And overall retail um, has seen a 7% increase in, in, in applications. So hopefully a, a rebound of that, of, of that sector, 38% um, applications of female and 57% um, applications from BAME candidates. So um, obviously we'll share this data with you afterwards, um, but hopefully gives you a, a good sort of measure at this point in time in terms of your own campaigns um, and how, how you might be comparing against others in your, in your sector. And then just to, I guess, sort of share some conclusions in terms of what we're sort of seeing before Sue and Martin um, talk you through their respective sort of areas. I think certainly from a, a graduate perspective, um, you know, the competition for the graduate market does, does remain fierce. It will be interesting to see, you know, how um, the current economic climate plays out over the next season and if that does impact, but it, it certainly feels like we're very much still in that candidate led market. Um, we've definitely seen a focus, you know, for, from employers on that on that recruitment piece. So really sort of streamlining their recruitment process, focusing on the quality of that process and getting those offers out early. Um, and that obviously is playing out in the in, in the stat that I shared with you earlier around, you know, the number of offers that have been made year to date. Female and BAME hiring continue to improve. Um, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. And I think, you know, we have reported here today on, on BAME as a, as a group. And what we do in our, our report in June is break down those individual um, ethnic groups um, so we can see the differences. Um, so that, that will that will probably reveal some, some challenges across those uh, across those individual groups. But but certainly overall at this point in time, um, there seems to be a positive trend there. And obviously, you know, in terms of that piece around, um, you know, the, the offers being made early, the keep warming, uh, keep warming onboarding activity is going to be particularly important over the coming months. Um, and it will be interesting to see how Renegs actually, um, you know, differ year on year. And that's something that we report on in our Full Insights report in June as well. Um, and from an apprentice perspective, you know, we, we all know that the, the market is growing quickly, so it's likely that competition will, will continue to increase even, even further there. It does seem that employers are going to, to market much later in terms of their, you know, their recruitment and, you know, their, their attraction and engagement activity. And Sue will touch on some of this, but, but does this need to change? Certainly as those number of um, opportunities increases and competition increases, it will be interesting to see how the market reacts to that. Um, those withdrawal, withdrawal rates are significantly higher for apprentices. So thinking about the recruitment process for them and just thinking about some of the reasons that that might be. And Martin touched on it earlier, but we, we tend to see a much lower Renee rate for apprentices. So it might be that 
you know, they're just withdrawing from that process earlier because they find the employer that they want to stick with, whereas graduates quite often hold on to those offers for much longer. So that's an interesting difference between the two groups and, and, and certainly something to think about for, for your own recruitment processes. Or it may be that apprentices genuinely need, you know, more support and help throughout the process, whether that be more coaching calls, whether it be just more information on the process so they're, you know, aware and understand what, what that process is. Um, and in terms of the, you know, the diversity piece, um, apprentices do sort of offer that opportunity to, to address diversity more, more broadly, but that attraction piece and making sure you're engaging with the right candidates um, and driving that diversity through the process is going to be going to be critical. So at this moment, that's some of the conclusions we're coming to and some of the, um, you know, the things that Martin and Sue are going to chat through now. So I will hand over to Sue, who's just going to talk you through sort of some of our some of our observations from the um, sort of attraction engagement um, and some of those um, considerations for for new season as well. Thanks, Emily. Um, anybody who's probably done a presentation or worked with us previously will recognise some of these hints and tips as we go through, I'm sure. Uh, the first one being the one that I talk about every year, um, and it's always a challenge, I think, for most clients in terms of gathering all those stakeholders together and getting commitments for, for campaigns. But the biggest thing that we can all do, I think, is consider planning early. So in terms of ideal timelines, uh, we should be reviewing and assessing uh, how the campaign has gone this season as soon as possible after closing and offers have been made so that we can evaluate exactly what went well and what we need to do. But the planning action should take place straight away um, as soon as that's completed. We should be making recommendations and having a look at what is on the market and what you need to do. Her early planning is going to be key and I'll pull out some of the reasons why as we go through in uh, some of these areas here. One of the other things that is quite key is having a look at your attraction channels that you're currently using, really having an analysis on how effectively they performed. It is not a case of what you've always done um, is what you should always do. The market does change, a candidate behaviour changes, and it's really important to have a look at how effective some of those channels are. There are also emerging uh, platforms and uh, media partners that are coming onto the market all the time, and they have new and interesting things to offer. So really having a look at what kind of channels that you're using to reach out to those students and see how they can fill the talent pipeline and how they want to be spoken to is quite key and making no assumptions that what you've always done is the right thing to be doing moving forward. So keep it fresh make sure that you're really having a look at what uh, students are wanting to hear from you and how they're wanting to hear it from you as well. Uh, I've put a note on here about market sizing analysis and review. Um, this is probably where it comes into a challenge for, for most employers. If you have uh, what we like to refer to as tricky locations, um, so sometimes regional uh, issues with um, locations like Bristol or Cambridge, uh, these can be quite challenging for individuals. And sometimes you might find that you're looking at a market where there is actually a very low number of uh, students and um, in the school and college leave a market actually looking for opportunities. But particularly with apprentices where students tend to gravitate towards opportunities in their local region, if you're fishing from quite a small pool in the first place, it's quite key to understand what you're doing and make sure that you're attributing enough of your marketing budget to have a look at how you might tackle and handle those candidates in a market that they are familiar with. So it's not just about looking at your competitors and what they're doing. You can't always match up to the ways in which they're doing it, it's about thinking about clever ways that you might be able to tap into some very specific talent in what can be quite tight talent pools in the first place. So understanding your market, making sure that you've done a review, seeing how things have changed locally, will be quite key to making sure that you can address what could be referred to as tricky a bit later on down the campaign line. I've also mentioned on here collaboration with universities, and uh, Emily mentioned this earlier when she referred to campus events being highly popular this year. And I think anybody who has been out on campus will know 
that it was quite tricky to get bookings in place with a lot of universities. They were very, very popular. So they went very, very quickly. So this plays back into the early planning and making sure that you're ready for what you want to do on campus. And as much as students are enjoying their assessments to be virtual, as Martin alluded to, um, we are finding that students really do like the opportunity to talk to employers. And of course, you're not always targeting final year students when you do on campus engagement. But understanding the universities that you work with and how they can work with you is quite key to making sure that you have effective relationships. We found that there is a certain number of activities and events that they might list on the website, but we found having conversations with them about how you might be able to get in front of certain schools of business, schools of engineering, and how those business schools are trying to have a look at ways in which they can invite employers onto campus to engage with their students. They're getting a lot more actively involved now. So really understanding who you want to work with and talking to them about ways in which you can actually engage with those students is quite key. One of the key stats that I like to share with, uh, with anybody when we're doing new attraction indications is that Gen Z has a, uh, an attention span of eight seconds. Um, which is quite traumatic, I think, for most of us in this business, but uh, it is not that they're attention deficit, and I think it would be foolhardy to assume as much. They just have a very, very strong filter about what they're interested in seeing and how they're interested in engaging. It's really important to make sure that the content that you're putting out is not only the ambition of an organisation, it is very authentic and personalised to the audience that you're looking for, so that they can resonate with what it is that you're telling them as a story and make sure that they can actually see themselves in role with you. Um, this is something that we pulled out, I think, in our attraction workshop last year, um, just how much students really want to know and understand about the role. And it leads into the honest and detailed program information that we've got on here as well. Um, there are ambitions for organisations, and we've mentioned a lot here about ethnic diversity and gender diversity. It's true to uh, an audience if you can say what your what is an ambition and what is reality and perhaps what groups and organizations you have within the business to promote those groups and how you can support them in their applications. But be very honest about it. They do a lot of research. Um, as I say, they filter very quickly as well, but do a lot of research to make sure that they understand who you are as an organisation and how they think that they might actually fit with you as well. Um, we spoke about time to hire. These, these increases in offers uh, at this stage in the process um, have probably come as a result of a lot of employers looking at how they visit their application windows. So we've seen more employers looking at sprint activity, so they're going much quicker, but they might stagger the start days. Waves of activities where we're anticipating a level of grenades and withdrawals. Fingers crossed we don't experience them, but for many we've started planning to make sure that we have activity ready to roll out. So the last and final point of here plays into that a little bit in terms of analysing and being prepared to make some adaptations. So whilst we set out a campaign, you know, go back to the beginning, we said plan early. Uh, we like to plan early, but we like to keep a little bit in, in the back pocket just to make sure that we're there and ready for any situations that might arise. So that could be changes in your requirements. It could be changes in timelines, uh, candidate behavior that might be surprising from one year to another. And just make sure that you've got enough there just so that you can tweak and amend things and make sure that you're ready to run an attraction campaign that students will respond to. I think that covers um, some key hints and tips from attraction. I'm just trying to find a mute button, I think. No, Martin, are you happy now to move on yep, to yours? Yeah, yeah, please do move on, yeah. Thanks, I will do my screen next to me. There we go. Okay, oh. excellent. So, <laughs> so just some of the considerations for assessment. There's quite a lot of overlap between what Sue said, some really similar themes across assessment and attraction. And the first thing to pick up on, because I've seen from 
Rachel and Catherine in the question and answers, some interesting uh, follow-up questions from that stat about 70% preferring virtual assessment centres. And, and, and it's a thing I hear a lot of people battling against stakeholders who still have the view that actually in-person is better. The, the, the last couple of years has been the, by far the biggest shift uh, I've ever seen in terms of assessment behaviour and, uh, and what's happening. And, and both the fact that people are much more comfortable with virtual processes, much more expectant that processes could be virtual, but also the fact they're not tied to particular locations for graduate schemes just means people are applying for many, many more processes. Um, so behaviour has shifted massively. That's why the first point is so important. So collect and use data. So this is why we've created and, and keep in touch as we look at the data around assessment centre trends. That's why we've created a standardised uh, assessment centre questionnaire. There's some questions we're particularly interested in in that. First of all, um, in the assessment process, has the candidate been able to demonstrate what they could bring to the role? So that's really, really important for candidate experience. Secondly, has their experience in that assessment process, assessment exercise, meant they're going to be more likely to accept an offer from that organisation? And it links into the, uh, the third point on this slide, but actually where we see people are more likely to say, yes, I, I am more likely to accept an offer and join this organisation, is if they feel, linked to Sue's point earlier about the sort of tailoring attraction messages, if they feel the assessment activity has been an extension of attraction, told them something about the role, that definitely boosts that view that they're more likely to join an organisation. And it makes complete sense because Candidates are, are, are completing multiple processes. Often they're completing the same online processes for various different areas. They don't necessarily set aside which organization is which. So if you're creating a very personalized assessment process, very tailored to the role, gives a really good realistic job preview, tells them something interesting about what they will be doing, um, that will give them a better feeling about the organization and make them more likely uh, to, to join you. So, some, so look at the data and also think about the data from different perspectives. So one of the things I'm really interested in as we build up this database is what does the uh, view on assessment centres be in either in person or virtual? How does that differ, for example, with social mobility? So I've heard both sides of it. I've heard some employers say, well, actually, in so, some social mobility candidates say um, they like the ability to join virtually and not spend lots of time and, and potentially money if you're not providing expenses getting to an assessment center. So that's a positive of it being virtual. On the flip side, I've heard issues around, well, actually, I, I don't have a good space to join an assessment center from, or perhaps I uh, don't want people seeing into my living space as part of an assessment process. So that's where it would be really interesting to see does it differ, do, do the sort of views on assessment centres differ depending on particular uh, demographic areas and, and linked into that point, Rachel, is there a difference in Renegade rates for, for virtual assessment centres versus in-person assessment centres? That'd be a really interesting area to, to keep an eye on. Um, the, the second thing I've put here is building assessments as blended from first principles. So in the past, um, organisations have expected candidates to go through uh, what I'd call a hurdled process. So you complete one assessment. If you progress through that, you, you go to another. Often that's done based on the cost of assessments rather than actually does it work because blended assessments where you're collecting more data points to make a decision with uh, is, is a really good way to get better diversity and inclusion statistics and also create a better candidate experience because candidates are jumping into one process rather than keeping having to come back to your process and having multiple potential withdrawal points. Candidate communications and practice materials are really important. Linking back to that point uh, I made earlier about the importance of candidates feeling they're able to bring their best self to the process and be able to demonstrate what they can bring to the role and then um, considering changes the final point as you go through um, and, and, and use assessments year in year there's a sort of view uh, that 
assessment center materials last for three years so once you've built an assessment center you don't need to touch it for three years and you can use it and then you do a really large refresh well we've had real success in using the, the vast amount of data we've got access to to sometimes tweaking a particular exercise or, or even going into the level of looking at particular indicators that assessors score against and saying well actually this is favoring particular candidates is there something we can do about that so again, look at the data and think about any changes that can be made that will have a big impact on your, on, on your candidate pool and, and a big impact on people accepting your offer and then actually starting on day one with you. So uh, those are the key considerations from an assessment side. So I'll hand back to you, Emily. Thank you both. So, I mean, that draws our, our sort of our presentation to a close. Hopefully that's given you some some first indications of, of what we've seen for this season and, and some of those changes. And also certainly for, for new season, what uh, what some of the things are that you might need to, to react to or, or think about in terms of uh, new strategy. So I can see I don't I can't actually visibly see them, but I can see that there have been a couple of questions come in, Sarah. So I'll, I'll hand back to you and, and uh, I'll let you facilitate those. Sure, well do. Martin's actually done an excellent job of spotting those and answering them as pretty much as we've gone through, but there's probably some follow-up bits in there that um, we could touch on. Uh, Phil, I can just see that you have put your hand up, so I'll come to you in a moment. Um, the, the last point about candidate experience and virtual versus in-face, uh, in-face, face-to-face um, assessment centres. Is there any, have you got views on that or is there any data to support that at the moment in terms of your own PSs and things like that? Yeah, that's a really good question. And again, it sort of comes into uh, the candidates want to feel in, invested in. So I suppose the bigger distinction is, is the online process a good one so simple things like is it, it, it are you just sort of sending them a word document and saying can you return this that is a virtual assessment center um, and and that would probably have a lower net promoter score than if it's using a uh, purposely designed digital assessment center platform that's branded for that client the materials are very very much associated with that role so it sort of depends on on the quality of of the materials there's not a specific difference for, between the two um, that we're seeing from the data from my experience it is more to do with the actual quality and, and the care that's gone into preparing that day which can be very high quality both in person and virtually OK, that makes an awful lot of sense. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pop a question out generally to the to the audience, because um, right, quite early on, Emily, you're talking about um, the, the kind of trends that we're spotting and the fact that, you know, the female in um, BME kind of applications are a big focus for employers. And actually, it feels like social mobility has just dipped a little bit. So I just wondered if people could pop in the chat Q&A, just, you know, some views on if you think that resonates for you and if you feel like you've got maybe a reason why that might be the case. It's just always helps to add some insight into the conversation. Uh, but Philip, I'm going to click on the allow you to talk button so you can pop your question to the panel. And there. Hi, can you hear me? Sorry. Yes, we can. Absolutely. Go ahead. All right. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, I mean, the things that you've identified are sort of very much uh, aligned with our findings as well. We've done some uh, work ourselves in the civil service fast stream area, uh, the graduate program. Um, I suppose I just wondered if there was anything that you'd identified around the specifics of the assessment methodology. Um, I suppose, you know, it could be gamified assessment or it could be, um, you know, continuing video interviews um, or other technologies that um, exist. Is there anything, you know, specific that you found is the way that uh, organizations are, are um, focused. Uh, the, thanks for the question, Phil. The biggest thing I'm seeing in the, it links back to that blended assessment, blended from first principles. So, so the, the, the thing that creates the biggest drop off, and I know there's another question about what puts candidates off during an assessment process, is that having to keep coming back into a, 
a process and 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 you know think back about that organization remind themselves of coming back into it um candidates are, are quite happy to sort of complete longer assessments from our experience if it means they're providing all of their data in one hit rather than jumping in and out so so that constantly coming back to candidates to say now we're on to this next stage is the biggest thing that we're seeing is, is is putting people off rather than any specific type of assessment yeah thank you so much i suppose just just a quick follow-up um how would if you have large numbers of applications um how would organizations tend to manage that in terms of uh you know if you have a blended assessment which is um covering most of the areas um that's that means that a lot of people are doing assessments that they previously wouldn't have been doing because they would have been sifted out at the stage one or stage two um is that um, part of the uh, equation, perhaps, or is it blended assessment um, always going to be the way forward generally? Yeah, I, 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 well, I think it's, it's a really interesting one because the volumes that you would be talking about would be really extreme compared to a lot of schemes. Bill. So that's um, a, an additional complex complexity of your environment. But typically, the, the using it as, as blended, if, if an assessment is, is genuinely blended from first principles, because what, what, what it has been happening in the assessment side of things is people use a number of different assessments that have been designed as standalone assessments and then create almost a stitched assessment of these different things. Um, and that often has cost implications and time implications from a candidate perspective. So if an assessment is designed to be blended, it's often the, the, the sort of price point per candidate and the time it takes the candidate is often factored in. But you do have to keep in mind what's a reasonable sift rate on an assessment. So if you're talking about extremely high volumes, you do need to be pragmatic and think, can you get everyone through one overall blended assessment? But the fewer stages you can get and the more data points you're collecting in each of those stages is a, is a, is a really important consideration. Thanks. Thank you so much. Cheers. Brilliant. Thanks, Phil. A um, couple of other questions have come in. Um, first one being, and I guess this could be, we're talking about um, assessment centres being an extension of the attraction experience. So it might be a, 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 something for both Sue and Martin to think about. But what puts, what puts candidates off during the whole assessment process? I mean, is it something like that where it's just not quite resonating with them in terms of what their attraction experience was or something more technical, maybe in terms of the actual assessment process itself? Any thoughts on what does put people off? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I would say the key thing is, does it give them a, a, a realistic view of the role and does it is it a, a, a role that they would want to do? So um, it, it can be so. So. Um, and you can have withdrawal rates that are acceptable that you would want to see because mm -hmm. if you create an authentic view of the role there will be people who opt out and, and one of the things that can put candidates off is very very overly complex exercises um you know there will be roles where that level of complexity is needed and that amount of a quantity of written content is needed but definitely uh, a particularly complex assessment center with you know lots of, of jargon perhaps would put put candidates off that so you may need to do it but that's something that we often see puts candidates off during an assessment process cool thank you um and then the last question that's come in please do pop any more that you have before we we do wrap up but um Question about the difference in quality of um, hires through virtual assessment centres compared to the in-person ones. It kind of the purpose place it's got the opposite problem, I feel, I guess, as in a, a much smaller graduate employer. And how do you then narrow down a large pool if you're if you're a you know a smaller employer, but possibly with less resources? So you know, does the impact of that affect quality? 
So, so again, just on the, the repeat, and this is why the sort of blended approach is, is better than that, that hurdled approach. If it's a smaller campaign, you probably would be doing a more blended approach anyway, but getting the different types of, of data points. So you're getting some information about their behavioral preferences. You're getting some information about um, their cognitive ability, some information about how they would approach situations they would face in the role. When you're gathering all of that information, by using that sort of all of those data points together to distinguish who to see at the final stage, that will increase the, um, the, the quality of it. Uh, it's interesting the way it's, it's worded with the, without having the in-person touch points to distinguish candidates. Mm. So I think the distinguishing candidates is more about the quality of the assessment materials use, you're using. I would be surprised there's a significant difference in the, what we say, the predictive validity of an interview ran virtually versus, um, versus in person. I haven't seen any data that actually having in person makes it a, a more accurate distinguishing of candidates. In fact, it could introduce more issues around bias and more opportunities for, you know, things like uh, small talk on the way to an interview that could impact how a candidate is perceived. So I think it's more to do with the, as I say, the quality of the assessment materials themselves rather than whether they're in person or virtual. Cool, thank you. Um, and then just what's popped up in the chat, uh, do you think the significant increase in AME applications and offers a direct result of the increase of international students coming to study in the UK? And a, a quote from the Sunday Times there. Um, any thoughts on yeah, the impact of the relaxation of work visa types? It's a little left field, it might not be your space, but any <laughs> ideas? <laughs> We're looking at some blank faces here. It's a great question, Abdul. Oh, no, it is, it is a great question. And I, I, from, from the data we have, I don't think I could answer that accurately, in all honesty. Um, I think it's um, a good, I've been noting down all the different questions as we as we go through, just in terms of what we might be able to look at in a little bit more depth as we as, as we pull together our data for, for the big insights report in June. So I'll, I'll add that to the list and, and in anything that we can you know, find around that we'll, we'll definitely share. And I think just all the, you know, all the questions that have been centered around that quality piece, uh, you know, virtual versus face to face and, and, and Phil's questions as well. I think we can definitely do some, some really nice data analysis on if there are any differences um, and obviously share, share that with you. So I don't think, as I say, I'm probably in a, in a position or I'm going to jump in guys if you think you've got anything else to add, but we can definitely add it to the, to the list of things to think about and, and look at as we, as we do the more in-depth analysis. Brilliant. Thanks, Emily. That's kind of the best answer you can give in that, in that situation. But I mean, there's always questions, aren't there? There's always more, you know, it's the whole thing with data and research is that you, you provide something and then there's like, oh, and what about, and what about? And, you know, your research and ours is, you know, it's always iterative. And I think it's, um, yeah, definitely I kind of watch your space for some more insight into that. And um, haven't had any other more questions coming through. I mean, are there any final comments from you, Sue or Emily, on? On, on you know what you've heard in terms of questions and thinking around that or anything else you want to finish and wrap up with she says as another question pops up so <laughs> you make any other comments you'd like to I'm just going to read it <laughs> I was just going to follow on from from what Emily says I think the uh, delving into the data will be quite interesting to see whether that is possibly international students pushing up application numbers and everybody's circumstance will differ, so uh, it depends on what stage you obviously take uh, data from students in terms of their, their, their ethnicity, uh, because we will have some clients who uh, can accept people with uh, applications from students with the possibility of their work visa types. There are some that will accept work visa types, but their ultimate goal is to have students who will stay and grow with them over the long term and then there are some that simply can't accept it so um, it will be an interesting one to look into it could increase the number of applicants but it shouldn't necessarily have changed people's approach in terms of hires so um, there may be a difference there when we come to look at the data it might have increased the applications but uh, not necessarily impacted the offers. 
Cool, thank you. That's helpful. Um, and the question that's come in is, is is a little bit more on perhaps on the engagement side um, in terms of in-person student engagement and the sort of return on investment on that um, in looking at the resultant applications and hires. So I'm guessing that's you know more in depth um, thinking about that connection between um, that in-person engagement in your attraction phase and and what happens in terms of the hires. I'm guessing you probably don't have that detail, but maybe something to consider. Yeah, I think definitely something to consider it is interesting. And um, I think we mentioned earlier about stakeholder pressure for assessment centres to be held in person, etc. Um, and yeah. there is often a desire to go back on campus because we feel that students do want that engagement. At the moment, our, our, our measure is largely that we find in-person events to have more engagement than virtual events when we're talking about campus activity. Um, it's very easy to not show up to an event you may have registered for, but hence a 30 to 50% dropout in terms of virtual. Um, but you're, uh, I'm assuming this is alluding to the fact that obviously time costs and resources quite heavy in terms of those road shows that you might do over the autumn semester. Um, I think we can have a look at uh, sort of branch of investigation there to see what we can do to measure the anecdotal feedback, I think, from most employers is that they have very engaging conversations and the quality of people who perhaps move through the process is quite good, but you definitely won't see quality, uh, quantity from that kind of activity. So people will make an effort to come and see you, but of course you've got a lot of second years and first years on campus attending some of those events as well. So it's a long game. So that's quite difficult mm -hmm. to measure, just building that brand awareness so that they know who you are and they know the sort of opportunities you have coming up as well. Yeah, I guess it might be easier to track from a, um, if, if people are doing sort of their own individual on campus presentations versus the careers fair, where, you know, you might be able to track more closely who's registered, who's actually attended that presentation versus just people who are coming to the stand to to have a chat. I just remember when I was doing it, it was very difficult to, to really put a figure on um, exactly what the return on investment was, but certainly those you know individual um, employee presentations were easier to sort of at least get a sense of who turned up and who then had gone on to apply. So I don't think it is about what you do when you're on campus. So making sure that you're actually registering interest so that you can probably, if you do it in the right way, you can follow those candidates through. Really, and then yeah. you will have more measures to actually evaluate the effectiveness of attending on campus. Makes sense. Thank you. And one last question that's popped up, which is, again, come back to somebody who works for a smaller employer with obviously less resource but have you got have you seen anything great that smaller employers are doing in a virtual space have you got any sort of little tips or examples of what may work if you have a sort of reduced resource from a campus perspective or from a, a across the board uh, more virtual assessment space yeah I guess one for you Martin yeah well a really interesting one so we do um fully bespoke assessment materials and we do fully off the shelf assessment materials that are ready to go for smaller employers and, and we did a huge um, assessment centre recently 75 candidates in one day um, for uh, one of our clients who used our fully off the shelf materials and we're interested in that question about would you be more likely to join this organisation so the, the, the typical view would be actually because it's not specifically tailored to that organization directly that could impact that um, but actually what the, the data from that survey showed is actually because it, back to that point the, the quality materials it was clearly linked to the types of interactions they would have in that role um, it was really really positive feedback so um there's often very cost effective ways to run really robust assessment center um, exercises without going down the sort of cost prohibitive, fully, fully, fully bespoke route um, with more off the shelf, slightly customizable options. So um, worth having those discussions. Brilliant. Thank you. So we're almost at time and i um, pretty sure no more questions come in. As I, I think it's been a really interesting session. Thank you, all three of you. Is there anything, Emily, you wanted to say just to wrap up? 
Um, no, just to say thanks for joining. And um, as I said earlier, we will have our full insights report um, that we released in, in June. So um, that will obviously be promoted through the ISC. And I've noted down all of those questions today. So we'll certainly try and dig out some, some more detailed data around those to, to share with you. But, but thanks for today. And if there's any questions or any other data that you're interested in getting for your own organisation, please don't hesitate to drop us a line where we can help you then, then we will and we'd love to hear from you. Lovely, thanks Emily and Sue and Martin. It's been really interesting and useful, I've no doubt. And we'll be sharing the slides with everyone so um, you can always pick up those exact data points in there. And as Emily says, any questions, send them over to Amber Jacks. Great. Right. Um, thanks everyone for joining us and hopefully we'll see you next time. Perfect. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.